Welcome. Today is Friday, December 21st, 2012. My name is Mark Depew. I'm the Director of Oral History with the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. And today I'm delighted to be with Vince Speranza. Good, after, or good morning, Vince. Good morning, Mark. Better get the right time of day here. Uh, you and I are old hands at this now, aren't we? <laughs> uh, let me just explain a couple of things here and then we'll turn it over to Vince and he can start telling his story. We met about two and a half, a little over two and a half years ago, and it was right at two and a half years ago that I interviewed you for the first time about your story as a, as a paratrooper in Company H, the 3rd Battalion of the 501st Paratroop Regiment, Regiment of the 101st Airborne Division. Right. And the central part of your story, obviously, was your experiences at Bastogne. But we talked about so much more than just that and had a wonderful time doing it. Well, since we got done with that series, um, your life has been evolving in ways that you could not have imagined. And it had very little to do with what... what uh, you know, with the experience of doing the interview, but because you became pretty well known in the 101st and the Bastogne circle. And what we wanted to do today was to pick up where we left off last time. And we left off last time with that incredible story. I think in 2009, your first trip back to Bastogne, what, 65 years 65 after? 65 years after the war. And, uh, the town of Bastogne discovering that you were the source of this legend that had existed for 60 some years about a paratrooper who was delivering beer to his buddies in the hospital. Now, Vince, we don't need to tell that story again, but what I wanted to do was to kind of pick it up from there. And I think maybe shortly after you came back from that 2009 trip, you went back to England in 2010, May of two, or March of 2010. March. Tell us uh, what happened on that trip. Well, I think I already mentioned Kelly Ann Sproul. She's a uh, very pretty young British singer known as the sweetheart of the British Armed Forces. And how um, um, I met her at, uh, in Bastogne as she was singing the World War II songs for the troops. Uh, she and her mom and I uh, sort of struck it, and they invited me to come to England. And uh, I went. I, it was uh, in March, and uh, coincidentally, we discovered that my birthday was March 23rd, Kelly's is March 24th, and his mother's March 25th. We have a birthday cake uh, made up. But um, at the, uh, uh, in the, the discussion, in fact, one of the things that they were mentioning when they invited me to come to England is that they would take me to uh, uh, see where it was, what uh, I was stationed when we first got to England, and uh, the um, uh, the old Quonson huts at the town of Hungerford, uh, where uh, uh, we first uh, landed. Well, uh, going back, uh, she uh, they they took me to uh, uh, Hungerford, and um, I also asked if. Uh, the town of Brighton, which is the town that those of us that were stationed at Hungerford used to go to for uh, uh, recreation. <laughs> uh, and and uh, uh, when they took me to Brighton, I asked them if they could help me find a family, a family of uh, called the Radburns. And, and uh, here's why I wanted to find the Radburns. Back in '44, when we first went to uh, 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 Hungerford, and uh, three of us had a pass to go into town, and um, now we're new young kids uh, in England for the first time, for the first time out of our country, and for me anyway, and and we're looking for um, action. And uh, the first pub we came to, we went in and, and uh, we sat there and we saw all these old Englishmen sitting there uh, talking, smoking their pipes and drinking their uh, bitters. And we asked for, um, and we saw them go over to the fireplace where there was a bunch of pokers sticking in, in the fire and they'd take the poker out of the fire and stick it in the beer. Uh, we thought that was kind of strange because the beer was warm enough as it was. They don't serve cold beer in England, I guess. 
and and uh, they're making it even hotter with the polka. So finally, we we, we asked one. We said, uh, "What are you doing?" And he said, uh, "It's a tradition, old boy." And we said, "Okay." But we said, "By the way, sir, um, uh, do the ladies come in here?" And he said, "No, this is a pub. But, uh, you want to go to the ladies or down at the dance hall, uh, down at the turning?" And we said, "Oh, well, thank you very much." Sir. So we go to the dance hall. And at the dance hall, uh, yes, there was a lot of nice young ladies dance and so on. But the evening ended up three guys and only two girls. And uh, uh, they said, come on, Vince. And I said, nah, listen, magnanimously, I said, you go ahead. I'll go back to the pub and have another drink. And they said, no, we'll come on. Said, go on. And I went back to the pub. And they were pulling down the, um, the black shades, you know, for the uh, blackout. And uh, that enabled them to stay open uh, longer. And I proceeded to uh, get royally drunk. We sang and talked and laughed. And, and I, I didn't think I was in any kind of... When I walked outside the door, I started staggering, and three or four guys jumped me. They beat the hell out of me, took my money, my wallet, my pass, and, and uh, I had to a little bleeding on the side of the head, and they left me laying in the alley there. Well, about daylight, I started to wake up, and, and uh, I uh, felt, uh, got up and said, the MP patrols are going to be on their way here. Now, I don't have a pass. I'm AWOL. I'm going to go to jail. And I started walking down the hill, and, and uh, there was a little park and uh, a bench facing the, the, the road, and uh, all I could think of to do was I sat down on that bench and uh, feeling sorry for myself, an old Englishman comes by walking his dog. And as he gets past me, he says, uh, I said, Yank, are you all right? I said, no, considering the bunch of your guys just beat the hell out of me, took my money, my wallet, my pass, everything. And, and, and the MP patrols are going to start, and I'm able. He was horrified. He thought that was terrible. He said, please, Yank, come with me. I live right up there. Uh, come with me. My wife will clean your uniform, press everything, and so on. And I wanted to get off the road. <laughs> so, so I went, and, and I can't believe the way that family said. His name was Radburn, and his wife, and he had three children, little ones. He had been in the hit in North Africa with the British Army, and he was out of the war. And his wife cleaned my uniform. They washed the side of my head, and 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 uh, and she pressed it, and and uh, uh, everything was just uh, great. And then they put a meal out. Mark, at a time when the British were being rationed to one egg a month and and uh, a quarter of a pound of tea, you know, per person, they put out a meal like you wouldn't believe, with the. Um, that stuff that you put the uh, brandy on and uh, Yorkshire pudding, oh. Yorkshire pudding, and and I mean a, a whole meal with a cake and everything, and I, you know, was forever grateful. That night he took me in his truck, uh, in his car to where our trucks were parked to take us back to camp, and I had no trouble. I got back to camp, and uh, the next week I went by and I hit the supply sergeant up for a bunch of stuff. Among, among the, these was 10 pounds of tea, and she went crazy when I, when I, gave, her the, the, when I gave him the tea and so on. We talked a little bit um, and uh, exchanged um, addresses and so on. You know, we were going to stay in touch after the war, but, you know, nothing happened. I went back, and that's it. So when, fast forward now to 2010, Kelly and her mother and I are, are looking for I had an address looking for where the Bradfords lived. And uh, the house numbers skipped the number I had on, on, the, on these uh, addresses. And um, we, we then stopped and talked to a neighbor and said, listen, uh, we're looking for this number, but it doesn't seem to be. He said, oh, that house was, took a direct bomb hit during the war. It disappeared. He said, the family wasn't in it at the time, but we don't know what happened to them. And so I was very disappointed, but I said, uh, by the way, I said, is, uh, to be sure I'm in the right place, I said, is there a, 
uh, a little road down to a pond, and uh, they said, oh, yes. I said, with a bench uh, facing the... He said, oh, yes, it's called Queen's Terrace. And he pointed, and sure enough, we went out to the pub called the Fair Fairchild Fairfield Inn, and uh, go in the pub, and there is the the, the leather bench that uh, we had sat on, and and uh, the fireplace with the pokers uh, sticking out of it, and an old Englishman sitting in the corner there. And I said, uh, "Excuse me, sir." I said, "Was this pub here uh, during the war?" He said, oh, yes, and so was I. <laughs> and he said, uh, I said, is there a, a, a road and a bench and a park? He said, oh, yes, right down there. So we went outside, walked down the road. There was the pond and the park and the bench. And I sat on the bench, and I had Kelly take my picture where 65 years ago, as a 19-year-old kid who had just gotten beat up, sat on, and I was sitting in that same bench. I think we've got a picture of that that we can show, uh, both the pub <laughs> and you and the park. Oh, there, yeah, there's the, there's the pub and, and the bench, right. Correct. Well, I uh, had a very nostalgic moment, let's say, and, and uh, re retracing those steps and, and uh, finding the, the, those places still intact. And then uh, uh, Kelly and her mom took me to uh, uh, Brighton. Uh, well, this was in Brighton. But they took me to the other parts of Brighton where I recalled going to a movie theater and uh, some other places. It was very nice uh, and uh, very nostalgic for me to see all these places and be following in the footsteps of a 65-year-old adventure when you're a 19-year-old kid. I think we've got a picture of you and, and Kelly and her mother as well here at the show. And right, right. And, uh, that was one of the pubs where we went to lunch. And uh, I don't know if I dare tell this one, but um, they took us to a... To, they took... Mark said, I... I hey, it happened. It, it happened. Look, they took us to a tea room. And uh, uh, this is the tea room in Brighton. And they're, they're very proud of their old English tea rooms where you have tea and, and, and biscuits and, and so on and so Tradition on. Tradition is more important to them than us, I think. Well, they didn't know they were taking me to one that I recalled from uh, the time. And, and I, I, um, I said, you know, this uh, tea room looks familiar. She said, oh, it is an old one. It was here during the war and so on and so on. I said, oh, yeah. I said. Well, I remember coming in here, and uh, we used to uh, come in here and sit down and have a cup of tea for uh, two pounds. She said, two pounds for a cup of tea? I said, oh, yeah, they were really charging us uh, in those days. What they didn't know was you came in there and you paid two pounds and, and had a cup of tea and then went upstairs to meet the ladies. Uh, and and uh, so I, they didn't know what I was giggling about or laughing about, but that's the picture that came back to me when, when we went into this tea room. And uh, they also took me to the White Cliffs, and um, we saw the uh, uh, places where the old, they, they had um, a, a hospital built into the cliff. Mm. And... Um, uh, the old Spitfire, the British uh, uh, RAF Spitfire, and so on, and uh, you know it was it was a, a delightful uh, trip back to England there in 2010. Well, to move the the story forward, because this is just one of many chapters here that we need to be talking about. I think uh, perhaps the next thing you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you got an opportunity in 2011 to go to Pearl Harbor on December 7th of no no less. Yes, uh, I was invited by a, a gentleman from Brooklyn who uh, uh, met, we met in Bastogne, uh, and uh, he was one of these people who 
you know, you could almost call them groupies who go to all the, the military reunions and so on and so on. They're, they're really just fascinated by uh, uh, the World War II thing. And he told me about this. I had never been to the Pacific, and I wanted very much to see. And he invited me uh, to come on this tour, and, and uh, I went. And it was a very moving experience, Mark. Uh, I had, um, I was befriended by a couple of ladies who, uh, uh, had been on this thing before and knew uh, the routines and so on, and they sort of took me in hand and and made sure that I got to see all of the uh, uh, proper uh, uh, things and best. Now, Mark, I know how this is going to sound, but but if you wear a hat, say you're a World War II guy, every place you go uh, in, in, in Pearl Harbor. There was a, a, an admiral giving a, a speech uh, uh, at, uh, in this uh, theater and so on. And, and uh, we walked in. He stopped talking and said, ladies and gentlemen, we have a World War II person with us. And then, you know, I'm embarrassed, but, but uh, everybody stands up and starts laughing. Mark, I'm an old man now. These things are starting to uh, pile up on me. But uh, the the general was talking about, you know, this is the anniversary of December 7th and so on and all that stuff. And uh, several times he keeps referring to, uh, you know, the World War II people, the World War II people. And um, <laughs> after that we saw a movie. And from there we went out to see the Arizona you know, where the, the guys are still buried and so on. And uh, I actually saw, when I went on to the monument there, the, the oil is still bubbling up from, from, the, from the, sh the ship, the, the sunken ship. And the, uh, at the ceremony, they, they, they rang a bell and announced each name of, of the, the people who were buried in that, in that ship. And they took me to the submarine, the bowfish, the, the bowfin, that was docked alongside there and uh, uh, played a part. And then they took us through the harbor, and where the sunken wrecks are still, some of them are still visible. And uh, and the navy put on a uh, demonstration that uh, I was so impressed with. Finally. Um, at uh, the beach, I, I'm walking uh, down with uh, these two young ladies, and uh, I keep noticing these two guys following us. And and finally, I turned around and said, "Hey," I said, uh, "Is there any problem? Are you following me?" They said, uh, "Yeah, we're from the FBI." And I said, really? I said, I haven't done anything, have I? And uh, they said, oh, no. We just heard your announcement and then so on. We're waiting for you to get a chance to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> and so we dismissed the young lady and, and uh, went out on the beach and smoked a cigar. And, <laughs> and they were just overwhelming. One of them um, is from Illinois. Um, Glen Arm, just uh, you know, a few miles from my house, and the other one was from uh, West Virginia. By the way, they, they, I just opened the box, they sent me a bottle of Johnny Walker. <laughs> <laughs> but we had a good conversation. And uh, the whole Pearl Harbor experience was uh, you know, a great one. And, and uh, I, uh, I just hope that, that more and more people get interested in doing these things and, and, and you know, seeing, you can see pictures, but it's not the same. Mm -hmm. I it, do think we have a picture of you there. Is that on the uh, submarine? That's thing? on the submarine behind the uh, the gun. I was uh, shooting down a Japanese plane. Well, it makes you appreciate, uh, you know, you're an old Army guy. It makes you appreciate what the Navy went through absolutely, as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And... Uh, and, and the people who are keeping that memory alive ought to be commended uh, as a reminder 
to today's gen Americans. Well, let's move on to the next chapter and more memories that are much more closely tied to you. And I think it was, was it December of 2011 also that you went from Pearl Harbor back to Illinois and then over to Bastogne again? Yes, I was home one day and I had, I had uh, from December 7th of that week and then December 16th is um, uh, Bastogne. Now, Bastogne in 2011 was uh, a repeat of uh, 2010 in terms of, uh, now I had gotten to know more people and they had gotten, to, and, and um, they were also now d d had done m more uh, research and so on. And this time, Marco Killian, the, the Dutch army officer that I've been telling you about, um, said, we found your foxhole. I said, my original foxhole in, in, in the battle is on? They said, yeah. They said, um, you were H Company, and Captain Stanley from H Company used to keep charts. In other words, in the archives, what they found is that uh, in his after battle report, Captain Stanley also had uh, the map, had a machine gun here, and, and I put a rifleman here and here, and I put the heavy weapons here and uh, so on. And they said, we have this chart, and on, there's only one machine gun uh, in Foxhole, so that had to be yours. Well, we went to go look at it. We couldn't go out on the land. It was fenced off, and it was pri private property now. Somebody else owned it. But I looked at that thing and looked at it and looked at it, and I, I, I just couldn't believe it. I said, no, wait a minute, Marco. You know, it's filled in. You can see the outline of a two-man foxhole. I said, if that was my machine gun nest, right here there has to be a foxhole and right here on the ridge, because they always put two riflemen to protect machine gun. And they said, yeah, look over there, and filled in yeah, there and, and, and here. And it hit me. Jesus, this is the, this really is the place? And then I said, no, wait a minute. No, Marco, if this is the place, there has to be a stream here, because I remember that morning I, I broke the ice just before the attack started, filled up my canteen and, and came back because we, we had dry mouth and so on. He said, yeah, he said, you can't see it because of the grass, but it's there. We walked over there and there was the damn stream. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Sixty-seven years ago, I was here, and this place was a massive artillery and mortars and tanks and then noise and, and snow and German troops uh, coming up. Well, this particular trip, you were the invited guest of the people of Bastogne, were you not? And I wonder if, if did you spend some time in the museum? Did you have any incidents there that well, stick with you? Oh, yeah. They have a museum now dedicated to the 101st Airborne Division and so on. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I come back to the museum, and there are uh, a bunch of people, and most of them want to uh, take a picture with me, or sign uh, uh, books. And, uh, fathers would take their young sons. Uh, Excuse me, sir, could we please? Uh, my son would like to. Uh, and I would say, sure. They take a picture. While I'm doing this and signing autographs and so on, <coughs> Guy walks up to me. He looks in his seventies, maybe, and he says, "Are you Vincent?" I said, "Oh yes." He said, "Are you Vincent, who was here in Bastogne during the war uh, with the Hundred First Airborne?" I said, "Yes." He tears up, comes up to me, and hugs me, and says, "I am Doctor Gouver." My father, Dr. Gouvert, and mother were here in Bastogne during, during the war. I said, oh. He said, 
my father passed away 11 years ago. But before he died, he called me and he said, bring the blue bag from the, from the, the dresser over here. And he said, I bring him the blue bag. And my father says, pulls out two pieces of yellow cloth and says, my father said, I must find Vincent and thank him for our family. And he says, then my father starts to tear up. And my father says, you must find him because during the war, in the battle, when we were surrounded and cut off, our house took a direct bomb hit. And, and we were not in the house at the time, but, but when we came back to the house, there the whole house collapsed, and we're on the sidewalk uh, crying, your mother and I, and Christine, and Thomas, and 12-year-old Anne Marie. And he says, this GI comes walking by and says, hey, get down in that basement. This artillery is going to go on all day. You better get out of it. He said, and he, he came down to the basement. He helped us pull out the, the, some of the beams and so on. And he gave us each a cigarette and he said, and don't worry, the 101st Airborne will not collapse. The Germans will not come back to this town. And he walked away. And then from day to day, he would come, bring us, he had a can of string beans one time, he had, uh, he had, and always a chocolate for uh, Anne-Marie, uh, the, the deep bar chocolate. And every time he left, he said, and don't worry, the 101st Airborne Division will not collapse, the Germans will not get back in this town. He says, and then my father almost choked up he said, Christmas morning, Christmas morning, here comes this GI in his helmet. He's got a bunch of things. He had two packs of, parish, uh, of, of cigarettes wrapped in yellow parachute cloth for me and for Thomas. He had little bauble bracelets for your mother and Christine. And he had a coloring book and crayons for Anne Marie. And he wished us all a Merry Christmas. And he left. He said, we, we couldn't be in the middle of the, the, the war. Somebody comes to wish us Merry Christmas. And then he pulls the two pieces of yellow parachute cloth out of his pocket. And they say, you know, Merry Christmas from Vincent. And then he told me that Anne Marie is still alive, but she's bedridden. She wants to see me. She still has the coloring book and crayons that she wants to show me. I was supposed to go back this time, and I didn't. But, uh, you know, I took some pictures with, uh, you, you don't have them. I tried to give them to you the, with uh, Dr. Gauvert and so on. And, uh, uh, had you remembered that story? Not until he started telling it. Uh, when he started telling it about uh, the, the, the family standing on the sidewalk crying because their house had been bombed, some of it started to come back. When he pulled the pieces of yellow parachute cloth out of his pocket, and I, boom, and, and I, uh, Mark, you know, like I said, since 2009, I've been on a, an, an emotional roller coaster, and uh, one of these things there just. I'm curious. Do you remember where you found the jewelry and the coloring book and the crayons? Oh, I <laughs> liberated them from a bombed-out store and in Baston there, uh, down the road a piece. The spoils of war. But that's another remarkable story you've got to pass on. Well, I saw him again uh, this year. Dr. Gauvet came in to say hello and wish me Merry Christmas. He brought me a box of Belgian chocolates and so on. 
I remember, I, I wonder if you could tell us also, you were just mentioning before we started today, um, about December 26th at Bastogne, 1944. And finally, you've started to see some Air Corps. Mark, we were, by December 25th, we were in there since the 17th. We had been surrounded after the first day, after the second day, we were surrounded. And, and there were seven German divisions out there trying to get in, and one under strange parachute division saying, like hell. And by the way, they never set foot in Bastogne, you know. One errant German tank ran out of control one time and got through the perimeter, and uh, they have they have they have video and everything of this this German tank. Uh, and by the way, the guy the tank commander got out of the tank and, and surrendered. They they never got in. They never got in the best time. But we were in by the 25th. We were in bad shape. I had four rounds of uh, rifle ammunition, nothing from uh, for the machine gun, and uh, the artillery. You know. You don't know this at the time. You, you read about it later. Um, <clears throat> the artillery was down to like two shells a day. They, they could only fire uh, uh, if there was a heavy concentration and so on. And uh, it was getting bad. You know, earlier on, the Germans had come in and asked us to surrender. And we laughed at them. And you heard the famous uh, McAuliffe saying nuts uh, to, to, the, to the German surrender. By the 25th, though the situation got bad, we, we couldn't act cocky anymore. And uh, it was snow in that night, and it was pouring, the, 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 the kind of snow that hurts, you know, it, it, the stiff, um, uh, um, almost like ice, uh, icy snow. A stinging snow? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and um, you know, we had no gloves, and I had no, no your feet were wet all the time and so on. And when uh, when you had to go out in that kind of weather, there it was even worse. We were pretty miserable. The morning of December twenty sixth. Now you know you never sleep. You just doze you know, here and there. Uh, and uh, the Germans had a bed check Charlie guy who came over and bombed every night. Nine o'clock. You could set your watch. He had no specific targets. He was just harassing us, keeping us awake, and, and so on and so on. And uh, the night before Christmas, Bedcheck Charlie came over, and all of a sudden the sky exploded, and Bedcheck Charlie was no more. What we found out later was that um, the Army had the new Northrop night fighter, and they sent one out. Um, and and uh, took care of bed check Charlie. But the 26th, the morning of the 26th, the sun came out. All of a sudden, uh, they, they, we saw our shadows. And and you can't believe the feeling. You know, it, it had been foggy and rainy and snow and all the time that for the for the whole week. And then all of a sudden, now the sun is out. It's not snowing, and you can see your shadow. And six P-47 Thunderbolts come out of the sky. Uh, I'll, I'll never forget. The, the nacelles on them were painted. One was red, one was blue, and one was yellow. And then again, red, blue, and yellow. There were six planes. They came out, and then they started diving down, strafing and bombing. And uh, from where we were, we jumped out of the foxhole. And we, by the way, the Germans are shelling the hell out of us, but but we're just going, give it to them, give it to them, yeah, yeah. We're yelling and hollering. The, the, the plane dies, and you see the yellow flash and, and of, of flame and so on. And then the sound comes to you, wham, and we hit them here, and they hit them here. They, f they flew all around us, dropping bombs and, 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 and uh, strafing, and... Uh, Excuse me. When they got finished, they say they, they flew to, to one end and then flew straight over the town overhead and waggled the wings. <laughs> and we said, Yeah, man, the Americans have finally landed there. And it changed the war. Right after that pattern, you know, uh, and I saw the man sitting on the tank like this, you know, uh, with his two uh, white pearl handle uh, six shooters. But uh, 
We had expected then, you know, that, uh, well, okay, now we're going to be taken back for a little rest and rehabilitation. Like hell, Eisenhower decided that we and the, uh, the Germans are retreating to Germany, and he decided that we and the 82nd uh, ought to encourage them a little by booting them in the pan. And, and we were in the area until January, about January 19th, and uh, January 19th, we started uh, moving forward to, uh, the Germans were fighting a rear guard action now as the rest of their army was uh, retreating back to Germany. And uh, they stopped uh, at uh, a little town called Hufeliz, uh, about uh, 10, 12 miles from Bastogne, and put up a fight there, and, and, and that's where I got hit from a, a mortar shell, and, and uh, I was out of the war for three weeks. Uh, two weeks in the hospital and one week they give you recuperation. I ought to tell you about that if we have time. Well, I think we did talk about that in the earlier interview, but I wanted, okay. I wanted to go take you back to Bastogne yeah. and uh, ask if you got an aerial resupply while you were there. Did that happen after the P-47s came in? I, yeah, I, I left out the most important part, yeah. Right after the P-47s left, I don't know what the number is. There, there's all different, 134, 234, C-47s. And hundreds and hundreds of parachutes, food, water, ammunition. No clothing. We still didn't get any winter clothes. But, but um, uh, artillery ammunition, especially for the 705. And... Um, uh, not much gasoline because we weren't going any place, and we had no vehicles, much vehicle, many vehicles today anyway. But uh, the resupply, 95 percent. They told us all this later. 95 percent of the bundles landed where they were supposed to, and one of the first priorities was to grab all those parachutes and run to the uh, the seminary and the church where the wounded guys are laying on the floor, and and wrap them in parachutes. Keep get them warm. That they. they you know, they had nothing but we, we, the curtains and things that we pulled off the windows. I told you about that, to, to wrap the wounded guys in. And those of us that had two blankets, a donated one, and, and everybody was freezing. And, but the, the wounded is what, you know, what bothered us. And uh, the parachutes were excellent. You know, wrapped the guy in all that silk there, and that uh, made us feel good. Well, that was quite a trip. Mm. And then it's not too much longer into 2012. Um, you keep 2012. This year has been a very busy year for you. Sounds like because I know in March I think you went back to England again, didn't you? Yes, I went back to England, and um, this time I uh, asked uh, Kelly and uh, her mom to take me to the local newspaper. And uh, I went to the local newspaper and I asked them, because a lot of times, you know, maybe nobody else knew about where this family was, but the newspaper has uh, investigative uh, or they have access to information. Whatever it was, I, I took a stab at trying to find the, the family in the newspaper. So I told them the story. You, you're, you're still looking for the Radburns then? Yeah. I told them the story. And uh, they said, oh, that, that's a very interesting story. May we print it? I said, oh, yes, but would you put at the bottom, if anybody knows uh, uh, anything of the Radburn family uh, that lived near the pub, the Fat Child Inn, and so on, uh, and I left my email address. When I got home, about a week later, I get an email. It says, dear Mr. Sprand, uh, I'm uh, Lynn Taylor, granddaughter to May Radburn, uh, who says that, uh, yes, she would love to see you, uh, uh, meet you, and, and so on, that, y yes, she is the one, she was the five-year-old girl who remembered a GI coming to the, her house uh, during the war and so on, and, and uh, the rest of the family is gone, but, uh, yes, she'd be delighted to see you. And so I, I had a planned trip to uh, Normandy and Holland in um, June, June the 6th, you know, the, the D-Day thing. 
And I arranged to stop in London before, before flying to, uh, to Paris. And uh, Marco met me there. And I had arranged with Lynn Taylor and her, her, her uh, grandmother to meet me at a restaurant. I took them to dinner, and uh, we took some pictures, which I tried to show you and so on. But she and I uh, were practically in tears when she said, you know, her parents told her the story later, time after time after time, about this GI that they picked up and, and helped uh, get back to his unit without trouble. And, and uh, I had a couple of pictures of her parents and them as kids that uh, she had never seen, and I, I showed them the, the picture. But it was a nice, uh, tearful, joyful reunion, again, with people that, with things that happened at that time, 68 years ago now. Well, and I, you had mentioned that you were, Marco had, uh, was going to be your guide, I guess, for Normandy and into Holland. Was that your idea, or was that their idea? No. Uh, <coughs> You know, I did not uh, uh, jump in Normandy or Holland. Right. I got to the war in, in Bastogne. And uh, I wanted to see, they, they kept telling me about that. On June 6th, the demonstration there, they have a demonstration jump out of an OC-47, mm -hmm. and they have, uh, and, and they would take me to the uh, fields where the, where the, where the, the paratroops landed and, uh, and show me the, uh, the fortifications at uh, at uh, Utah Beach, and I I, I can't ex describe to you how that went. We when when we got there, one of the first things we did was go to Utah Beach, and I was actually in uh, the the fortifications. Now here we've got a picture of this is the couple standard pictures of yeah. landings. I don't know if that would have been at Omaha or Utah, and certainly the one on the right is Omaha Beach, so you're at yeah. Utah Beach, but yeah. that's <coughs> Point de Hoc, isn't it? That's how you pronounce it? Something like that. Um, but, okay, that's the, fortifi <laughs> that's the fortifications, and I decided to take a, an appropriate picture there. But when you go inside that, Mark, you can't believe that, that and by the way, there was one of these every 100 yards, every 150 yards. That's, and that's an 88. And, and uh, the, the concrete above you is like uh, four feet of, of uh, reinforced concrete. And then a space about this big that the two machine guns, one on each side here, and the 88 in the middle and so on. And the rest of it, four foot, five foot thick uh, walls of concrete. And it's obvious that they're still there, the, the, the Navy 16-inch uh, naval gun, but they, they would make dents in the concrete and so on, but did, didn't knock them out. Some of the shell, if they're lucky enough to get into space, yeah, it tore the gun up and, and tore everything up. But I, I sat in, uh, uh, in that, uh, fort, that uh, fort there and looked. Every inch of that beach was colored. Mark, those guys that came up the beach faced murderous fire. The, the aerial bombardment and the naval bombardment didn't do a lot of damage. They thought it would, and they hoped that it would, but uh, you can't believe the feeling I got, you know. We always thought, hey, the roughest of the paratroops who land in the middle, uh, behind the line. But those guys that had to come up the beach against those fortifications, you know, I take off my hat to them three times. Uh, absolutely fantastic experience to, to see and, 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 and try to envision what those guys were up against. From there, we also, I was invited to the E Company Band of Brothers um, celebration to mark the, uh, the, uh, the monument to uh, uh, Captain Winters, uh, you know, in the Band of Brothers thing. And uh, that was, a, 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 you know, a, another moving experience as uh, my friend Herb Seward, who was an E Company guy, made a speech uh, telling about uh, uh, the, the men who landed in, in Normandy and, and the paratroops who landed in Normandy. And then I went to the church, uh, St. Mary Gleese, where, you know, the, para the, the parachute hanging there, the, you saw that in the movie, 
Yeah, anybody who's seen The Longest Day remembers that scene. Yes. I think it's yes. Red Buttons is the one who's in that movie. I went to that church, and uh, I, I have all kinds of pictures of this, Mark, if you ever want to see them. So, but uh, they, they have a parachute hanging there now, oh. wow. and they <coughs> in the same spot where the original one was. And inside the church, now, you know, during the war, all the stained glass windows were, were uh, blown out. When they replaced them, there's one with the logo of the 101st Airborne Division. There's another one with a paratrooper. In other words, <laughs> religious stained glass windows, but the World War II motif of the 101st Airborne Division in, in, in all the windows. And they showed us the, the holes in the, in the roof where, the, where a bomb had come in and so on and so on. And, and um, the, again, the experience, even though I know all about it, and so, I mean, I read all about it anyway, and so on, still to be there and see the, the things that, that, that uh, played such a prominent part in, in the history of that time was... Uh, well, good experience for me. And I know that wasn't the end of it. Then you guys, as I understand, headed up into Holland and the Market Garden campaign, did you not? Yes. From there, we went to Holland, <coughs> and I actually saw the bridges across the wall that, uh, again, in the movie, you remember where they had to go across and try to bring some guys at night uh, doing it. The, the bridges across the wall, one of them is still there and being used. And uh, I think I was the only World War II guy there for that one. And, and uh, I, Mike, I used to be surrounded by people taking pictures. And... and uh, Finally, I said to one, I said, hey, listen, I said, you guys are making me do the, the Hollywood thing here. They said, yes. They, they uh, showed me where my regiment, the 501, the landing field, where they landed. They showed me the field where when the gliders came in, um, they called it uh, Rommel's Asparagus. They put sharpened stakes in the ground facing the direction where the gliders have to come in against the wind. And, and uh, the, uh, the wind is usually prevailing off the sea. So they set these things up so that a glider coming in would be smashing itself up. And I actually visited a glider. A man had parts of a, a glider. And then, Mark, one of the most impressive things, they took me to a big farmhouse. And the farmer there, my age, he's still around, the farmer there told the story that when the Germans were there, they had equipment, you know, all over his farm. When they left, they couldn't take all of their equipment with them. The, farm, the, the thing is still around. Uh, the, the equipment's still there. The Americans came in. Now, you know the market conversation failed, and the Americans had to pull out. But this farmer did not want the Germans to, to, to get this equipment that they had left there the first time. So he, with a bullet, dug big holes in his farm and he buried a German tank, uh, Bofors guns, um, an, uh, an American army duck, you know, the wheeled uh, things there, and, and uh, a tank destroyer. And, and he buried them. When the Germans came back, uh, they didn't have the use of this equipment. That that was what he did. Well, you're right. These are big holes, then. Uh, they, he had a bolt. Uh, and 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 by the way, uh, I saw them. In other words, he has now dug out a little piece of each one where you can see there's a buried tank here and and a, and a Bofors gun there and so on. And but then he showed me um, the barn where he had built a false wall and changed the roof line so that it looked. And, and the room, and I went in it, was like maybe about 12 feet long and, and uh, no more than six, eight foot wide, where he hid uh, allied pilots that got shot down and so on but did not get captured right away. 
and Jews, and uh, he hid them there overnight or for a couple of days until the Dutch underground could take them and, and get them out. And Mark, the penalty for harboring those during the war was not only you get shot, your whole family, kids and all. And yet these guys, these front, were willing to take those kind of chances. You know, not only the military fought the war, Mark, there were a lot of civilian people who deserve an awful lot of credit for taking the, the, the chances that they took to help us out. And uh, what else did I do in Holland? You saw the windmill, where there was the big windmill fight, and, and it's still operating. Did you have a chance to get to Nijmegen, the, I think, which was yes. the bridge too far? Yes, Nijmegen, uh, Eindhoven, and uh, Ede. I think and by that's... the way, yeah, those are the bridges. And uh, I've been invited uh, to go back, only this time, the 17th of September, the anniversary of the Holland Jump, when they say the whole country celebrates, and uh, they would love to have as many World War II guys as they can find to go back there. I've been invited. This one will be free. <laughs> All expenses paid. Nijmegen was the British target, was it not? No, Arnheim was the, the British. Uh, Nijmegen, the 101st, the, 101st uh, the 501 anyway, landed near uh, uh, Nijmegen. Nijmegen okay. was okay. one of the towns and so on. But uh, Nijmegen, Erdi, and, and uh, what was the other one? There were three towns that the 501 was uh, in, involved in. Um, the British, you know, almost got wiped out, and in, in, uh, they were further north of Arnheim. Did you hear a lot of stories about both the D-Day jumps and the, the uh, Market Garden jumps from these uh, veterans who were in the unit when you joined them? Mark, uh, a... Uh, a replacement, which is what I was, uh, doesn't get spoken to very much, or uh, you know, until you prove yourself in combat, you're nothing in the outset. Now you you try to be friendly without you know going crazy, but, but uh, uh, I was only in the outfit three weeks before we went to war, the, the Boston, and. Uh, I didn't get to know Steve Pentec and, and, and Joe Willis and so on, but uh, that's all. Yes, uh, I would hear some, some stories now and then, but listening to somebody talking to somebody else. And uh, uh, what you saw in the movies, uh, especially the Band of Brothers, pretty accurate. Pretty accurate at the way things really were. Well, let's get you back to the United States, and I think... You went to a reunion in Atlanta for the 501st? No, the 101. Okay. I got, uh, by the way, I told you that when I got home from the war, I had nothing to do with any organizations. I didn't, as far as I was concerned, the war was over. There was a job. That we did it. It's gone. I don't want to have anything to do with anything. I put the, all these pieces in one part of my brain, and I, I shut it down. And until... 65 years later, you know, I, you, I've mentioned this to you again and again and again, that I, I was not interested. No, I was interested, I guess, but uh, I later find out, uh, Marco, that uh, probably I was too cowardly to face the white crosses. I did not want to go back and see this slaughter. Uh, it's hard to describe, but wh whatever the story is, um, when I went back, uh, uh, it was a, a, a revelation. But uh, in in Holland, uh, in uh, uh, Atlanta, I got a phone call one night before him, and and uh, this guy, a voice I don't recognize, or I don't know, he says, uh, "Are you Vince Brand?" I said, "Yeah." said, are you the Vince Brands with the 101st uh, during the war, Bastogne? I said, yes. He said, where the hell you been, man? I said, who the hell are you? I he said, oh, well, he said, I, I didn't mean to talk like that. He said, but I'm uh, Master Sergeant George Boss, 29 years with the 101st Airborne Division, he said. Not World War II, he said, I was uh, Vietnam uh, on, he said. 
But he said, we're looking for you guys. He said, we're having a reunion in Atlanta. <coughs> Excuse me. There aren't a lot of you guys around, and we're trying to get as many together to uh, put into it. I said, they said, how did you never join the union? I said, well, I just wasn't interested. So well, man, he said, we, we're interested. We, we, will you join? I said, sure, send me the papers. And I'll join. And I... Uh, I got the papers and I, I, I signed up and became part of the uh, 101st Airborne Division, 101st Airborne Division Association. By the way, they've got like 800,000, uh, 800 to 1,000 uh, active, not active, um, yeah, a active in the organization and they are affiliated with the the active 101st Airborne Division at Fort Campbell, and so uh, the Atlanta thing was at Fort Campbell. I had, uh, are we running short of time? No, we're good. Uh, okay. I had uh, no idea what it was going to be like, or what it was all about, and um, I had my hat, you know, that said World War II, and uh, when I when I got out off the uh, the transport from the hotel into to the to the hotel where the where the reunion is taking place, as soon as I got off the bus, the the uh, shuttle, four guys, big guys. Hey, by the way, <laughs> Mark, the the division <clears throat> is a division of giants. Every place you should see the pictures. Every picture, you know, I'm like this, and they're all. During the war, there was a lot of little guys like me. In fact, they preferred smaller parts. We came down easier and lighter, and we rode, and, and the, the big guys came down like a ton. But at any rate, they're all giants. They, four, these four big giants come come walking up to me. I said, are you uh, on the first? Uh, I said, yeah. Man, they grabbed the, literally grabbed me by the arm, moved me inside, they said, uh, you were a, Oh, five, I said, 501 H Company. I said, oh. They took me inside the place. They said, man, they said, you're not wearing enough. And they went over to wear all the medals and ribbons and so on and so on. And, uh, you know, all I was wearing was the bronze star and the purple heart. They said, no, oh, you. And they started pinning stuff all over my hat, all over my uniform. Uh, and then they took me out to the hospitality room. This is in the, it, it's in the morning. Hospitality room. Uh, they said uh, this doesn't open till one o'clock. But uh, hey, bring this man a drink. I said, hey, it's, it's, uh, it's a celebration, man. You, what, what two guys? First time you're here, and so on. So on. To make a long story short, Mark, I, I was treated like a king. They took me every place. Uh, they 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 took me to the museum. They they took me, and at night uh, at the hospitality room, people would gather to talk and so on and so on. Well, after a scotch or two, I like to sing, right? <laughs> and and uh, so I'm saying, you mean you guys? Uh, by the way, they're all air assault now. They're, they're not jumpers. Uh, the helicopter. I said, you mean you guys don't remember the old jumps? And I started singing. Uh, Is everybody happy? Cried the sun and looking up. Our hero bravely answered yes. And then they stood up and the guys are going, yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, on the stage, there's a there's a disc jockey. He's supposed to be doing the entertainment song. And then, when I started the chorus, go re go re, what a hell of a way to die! Everybody is joining in. The disc jockey comes down with the guy. He says, "Hey, if you're gonna entertain, yeah." <laughs> now, like I said, uh, false courage. But you think it bothered me? I took the microphone. We went up on the stage. I said, all you guys, come with me. Now, by the way, somebody took a video of this. It's on uh, uh, Facebook, YouTube, uh, someplace there. The, the whole thing, the video of us. We went up on a stage, and we sang all the verses of the Paratroop song. Came back down again, got another thing. When I left, before I left, they were calling me Airborne Vinny, and, and uh, the, they invited me to the... February one uh, th that's coming up. Now, I'm going. And they said, hey, man, you're going to sing the paratroops on again? After two scotches. 
happen. <laughs> were, were there many other World War II veterans at that reunion? No, there were six altogether. No, seven, I, me and six other guys. And uh, two of them were in wheelchairs. And by the way, the, uh, the whole division, you know, uh, Petraeus and a whole bunch of people coming there. It was the, the birthday of the 101st Airborne Division when it was first formed, I guess. But whatever the story is, uh, they, uh, the, the whole division is going to pass in review. Uh, and the reviewing stand has, uh, you know, Petraeus, the Secretary of the Navy, Secretary of the War, this and that. The big shots, uh, the uh, State Department, and so on. When the division from the far end of the field, here's the, here's the reviewing stand, far end of the field, the division comes marching around. Now, this is 12,000 guys. Comes marching around. About 200 yards from the reviewing stand, they stopped and they took the World War II guys, put us out in front. Even the one in the wheelchair with a guy uh, pushing him. And the division starts up again. And the, uh, when the World War II guys get to the reviewing stand, Petraeus saluted us. You know, we did the eyes right. Uh, and those of us that could walk, you know, we march uh, with the division. But when we got to the reviewing stand, and we did the eyes right, Petraeus saluted us. And we walked by, and of course we fell out right away. <laughs> and the rest of the division kept walking by. But another marvelous experience. And uh, after that one, I got a call from the 501 Regiment uh, uh, Association. They got my name from the other. They said, you haven't come to any of the 501. I said, no, I'm not a member. Said, well, please. And, and, and I went to the 501 which was in Atlanta also. Yeah, by the way, the, the, the 101st uh, reunion was not Atlanta. Exactly. It was uh, Memphis, Tennessee. Okay. Uh, and Memphis, uh, and the hotel, you know, is like a, uh, Fort Campbell's on the line, Kentucky and, and, and uh, Tennessee. Atlanta was the 501. You have to pardon an 88-year-old's Well, I might have, I misled you, Vince. I <laughs> misled you. Uh, but I went to the 501 reunion in Atlanta, and that was a good experience, too. There Were these strictly guy, World War II veterans, or this is... There's a handful and uh, th that are members. There was only one guy there, and he was older than even 94. But he was with the, with the 501 uh, uh, during World War II. He, he was actually a Normandy jumper, and uh, we had some great discussions. And, uh, and I asked him, the, the most important thing I wanted to know is, how close did the movies and so on come to him? He said, he said Band of Brothers, they, they made a net real effort to make it uh, real and look real and so on. And he said, D-Day, yeah, there was a little extra drama in there, he said, but uh, that was pretty accurate too. I said, and then there was another one, an old, old, old one called Battleground. I said, oh, I know that movie. I said, I was in it. He said, you were in it? He said, yeah. I said, yeah. I said, you know what happened? In Bastogne, there was a life photographer caught in there with us, uh, and he took pictures all the way. And uh, when, when, when we went, in 1948, they had a, uh, a, a special showing in... Columbus, Columbus, Georgia, right? Columbus is Georgia. Columbia, South Carolina. Columbus, Georgia. In Columbus, Georgia, they, they, had, they sent us all a letter. They said, listen, we want you to come and, uh, you know, all expenses paid. We want you to come and uh, uh, we're going to preview this movie with you and we're going to give you a card which says, which you, where you can say, that's crap, it didn't happen like that. Or, yes, that was correct, and uh, this, and this, and this. And they showed us this movie. They started showing the movie, and there's one scene where a squad is coming up the road, uh, you know, snow, uh, coming up the snow, making the turn. The first guy was Sergeant Red, and my guy, the second guy was, uh, I forgot who, the third guy is me carrying a machine gun on my, <laughs> on my shoulder. 
So I went, when I got home with the whole family, hey, listen, you got to watch, we got to go see this movie and so on and so on. When it got to the movie, that scene was cut out. Uh, a lot of the actual footage was uh, cut out when they started showing it on television. While it was uh, still in the movies, it was in there, and, and a couple of my family did get to see it. But uh, when, it, when it got to television, and, and I, when, as soon as I see that it's on, I say, hey, hey, the movie, I'm in it. So I, no more. Mm. They, they cut it. Did you have a chance to meet any of the stars? Van Johnson, I think. James Whitmore was another <laughs> one. <laughs> That's who was in there in the movie. No, I, they didn't have any of the movie stars there. They just showed the movie. Mm. It is one of the classics of World War II, <laughs> and it was made just a couple years afterwards. So I would certainly recommend people to see that one as well. Okay. And they can, they can think, oh, what a shame it was that they cut out Vince's part. <laughs> Did you have a chance later that year to also go to a Band of Brothers reunion? Yes, Kansas City. Uh, Herb Seward, who lives in Minnesota, and we met at, uh, in Baston, uh, is the president of the the uh, Band of Brothers Association, you know they have a an incorporated association. They've been in business, you know, for years, uh, reunions and all over the place that uh, I never know anything about. But um, he invited me to come to this. This is going to be the last. It, it is the last reunion. That I, there's only two guys left that can travel, and uh, they came to 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 this one, and we had. Uh, we had an excellent time. I really had a chance to sit down and talk to these guys this time. And uh, the uh, one was an officer who had been an officer, excuse me, during, during the uh, uh, battles there. And, and he was really knowledgeable. In other words, they stayed together after the war and, and kept each other's stories uh, told. And so that's why Stephen Ambrose, when he wrote the book, went to see these people. He had uh, the best resource <laughs> group in the world. W right after the war, they started meeting, and they met every year since then. This is the last time in Kansas City. Uh, that's what the, the, uh, they had, they had a certain, uh, emblem. I've forgotten what it looks like now, but, but I, I have one. They, they, they gave me one. And um, y you have to feel bad, you know. These guys who, uh, you know, stayed together and became famous, uh, a book and, and a movie, and the best resource people you can find, the best guys you can find to sit down and talk with, uh, because you know they had to go over everything again and again to make sure it was right and accurate and so on. And yet they're all dying off. There's only two of them left, and uh, a valuable resource is gone. So that's got to be a very bittersweet kind of an experience. Did they have a lot of? Uh Children and grandchildren there. Families of all kinds, yes, and and uh, I have pictures. Uh, and they gave me a, a photograph of uh, whoever's left in the band of brothers, and they signed it. And then they did me the honor of letting me sit up there with them when they when they were interviewed by the newspapers and so on and so on. You know, and of course, the first thing I would mention is that uh, I was not uh, Band of Brothers. I, I'm an invited guest, and I appreciate it. But a um, great bunch of guys, and and and, uh, and Mark, and they're, they're disappearing like well, mm. like all of us. We have certainly come to venerate those guys who represent that company. But your experiences were really no different in a, in a basic way than their experiences. To his credit, Herb Seward who represents them, and when, when he makes a speech, he says, you know, let's be assured that we all know that E Company was one of a hundred rifle companies in the 101st Airborne Division, and our experiences 
were no different than the rest of the people in, in uh, the 101 who fought these battles. In fact, now, <laughs> I'm going to get a little catty here. If you were to select, if you wanted to select for a movie or a book or something, the regiment that did the most in the war in terms of uh, battles and casualties and so on, you would have to select the 501. The 501 is the only regiment who received the Presidential Unit Citation twice. And they're the only regiment that received the Presidential Unit Citation for Normandy. They were singled out from the whole uh, 101st Airborne for a President Unit Citation for what they did in that battle. They also, uh, you know, got the Dutch Order of Orange in, in Holland and so on. And in Bastogne, got it again. So um, I take off my hat to the 502 and the 506 and the 327. But also uh, I'm uh, proud to mention that the 501 uh, is the only regiment in the history of the United States Army that received the Presidential Unit Citation twice for valor in combat. Well, however you slice it, you're in pretty <laughs> elite company, Vince. Oh, man. And, and what a bunch of guys, Mark. I, I think, in fact, I know you just returned from Bastogne for yet another trip. Can you tell us about that trip? Mark, this time I had my grandson with me. I wanted someone in my family to experience what I've been experiencing in Bastogne with these people. It's hard to believe that these people are the way they are. But <clears throat> this time, Marco got the permission of the landowner for us to go actually out to the foxhole, where, where it is, not, not from the road. And Mark, I, I gave you a picture. No, you, you don't. You, it no, I, I do want to say you've mentioned several pictures, and I'll make sure that once we get this up on the website, people are going to be able to see these well, pictures. Okay. I, I've got uh, pictures of this. <clears throat> but we were able to go out to the foxhole and stand in it. I, it's it's f filled and it's got water uh, in it and so on. And in fact, I was. Half, half of my, my shoes were uh, But I was able to stand in my foxhole. That, by, by the way, uh, Michael Killen had, had dug out and he found two bullets that had to come from my machine gun. Th they were both scarred from the, from the breach. In other words, um, you know, when a machine gun doesn't fire, you do corrective action, you, you kick out the shell, it won't fire. And it must have happened twice during the battle. And those shells were in it. And part of the belt, the machine gun belt, they found. And, and, and look over. Now, it's not the same without snow. You know, there was no snow today, this time. But the whole battlefield again, the, the hill, the German artillery was right behind that hill. When the first uh, uh, wave attack came, it came up here. There were the barbed wire fences down there that they got tangled up in. Mark, I stood yet, last week on the spot where 70 years ago, 70 years ago, I was a 19-year-old kid uh, with a machine gun. And, and, and uh, my grandson, I pulled him over and I said, you are standing, and he's 19, I said, when I was your age, I was standing right here with the machine gun. Uh, you know, you get emotional, tears in your eyes. Luckily, one of the boys had a flask with some good Irish whiskey, <laughs> and uh, we had a drink afterward and uh, calmed down a little bit. But. I, uh, you know, I, I met with some people again, beautiful people, that, that, uh, and everybody wants to take a picture with you and, and uh, sign uh, people. I, uh, people want their coat, uh, a civilian coat, please. Uh, your, your coat? Yeah, and, and I, I sign their, their name, uh, my name on the coat. And, and um, 
the uh, mayor of the town of Bastogne put uh, uh, they have they, they call this the nuts weekend you know uh, uh, McAuliffe and and the nuts and and one of the things you do is you go into what they call McAuliffe's cave it's where the the headquarters was down in the in the cellar of a pretty strong uh, building and there's all kinds of pictures in there and they got a picture about this big of me the, you know the, the World War II guys that have visited there's a whole bunch of them there and I'm in there now uh, in the McAuliffe cave and uh, another picture they have in there the last time I went not this time the last time I went there were a bunch of um, Belgian school children and uh, I have a picture of this too and they they put a picture in there of uh, me with these Belgian school children because I, t I tried to talk to them and of course they speak only in French and I said uh, uh, you speak English? Parlez-vous uh, anglais? No, the kids all shake their head and I said uh, uh, Parlez-vous français? No, they, they were Flemish uh, speakers and I said, well, I said, I know you know this, Frère Jacques, uh, Frère, <laughs> and all the kids said, Dormez-vous, Dormez-vous, sont mille matines. Well, somebody took a picture of it, and now the picture is in McCullough's <laughs> cave <laughs> of me singing with the kids, the Belgian kids. Uh, this isn't the picture, but I do think we have a picture of you with some, some people That's you were talking to. That's Holland. Uh, they're, they're journalists, and they... they but it captures the moment of how fascinated people are up to hear Mark, your stories. That's what I'm. That's what I'm trying to tell you. That, that the the people there, the people there, seventy years later, are still saying to you, "Thank you for our freedom. Thank you for keeping the Germans out. Thank you for making sure that that uh, our children are born in in, in freedom." And so, on. and and little kids come up to you and they salute you. Thank you for our freedom, Mark. You know it does something to you, and 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 you saw the picture there. Adults too they look at you, and, and uh, I'm doing my best to keep from getting a swell head. The 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 uh, the way the, the the way the the people of Europe uh, show you. That they are grateful, their ancestors, uh, for that they are grateful for what the 101st Airborne Division did. In uh, of course, any other division would have done the same thing in the same circumstances. But as far as they're concerned, 101st Airborne Division up against seven German divisions said, "No, you guys aren't getting in here." That's all there is to it. Remind us again, what took you back there? the first time when you returned after 65 years? Mark, I was in Florida and went into a store. Uh, it was a gun shop. I was shopping for, um, I was going to get a sight for my, for my gun, uh, my rifle. And, and uh, the woman who came up to serve me, you know, well-dressed, middle-aged, good-looking, uh, had a, an accent when she spoke. So I said, oh, madame, do I know a French accent? And she said, no, Belgique. I said, oh, uh, Belgium. She said, yes. She said, have you ever been to Belgium? And I said, well, yeah, but it was during the war. All I saw was bombs, bullets, and snow. And she said, oh, you were in Bastogne in the war? I said, yes. She said, the, the, the 101st Airborne Division? I said, yes. She said, oh, monsieur, she said. I come from Boston. I only in the United States nine years. She said, uh, you have not been back. I said, no. She said, oh, you must go back. She said, the people of Boston have never forgotten the 101st Airborne Division. They celebrate every year. You have not. Uh, I said, no. She said, you must go back. She said, you go back to Bastogne and wear a little pin or something that says, 101st Airborne Division, you don't buy a meal or a drink the whole time you're there. I said, well, that sounds good to me. <laughs> well, here's the and and uh, I, I, I started talking to my family. Oh, Pop, you're 85. I said, well, then why don't you come with me? 
So my daughter said, okay, I'll come with you. Now, M Mark, we knew nothing. We know nothing about what's happening. We know nothing about the celebration. So we, uh, my daughter and I were going to go and just uh, get a taxi and go out and look around town, see if I can spot something. But when we got to Baston, uh, we're going down to the bank to uh, convert our money to euros. And, and my daughter sees in a window uh, a mannequin with a complete 101st Airborne Division view with an eagle patch in, in a window. And I, I had walked past it. And my daughter pulled me back and said, the coincidences that are happening now, Mark, is incredible. She, uh, she said, well, she called me, Pop, look at this. And I looked and I said, oh, well, let's go in and see what it's all about. When we go in, it's, it's like a, oh, it's like a warehouse. It's got all... World War II Army equipped. There's a tank in there, there's a jeep, there's uh, uh, guns and all kinds of uh, uniforms. Uh, yeah. But all World War II in here. And behind the counter, there's a great big guy in an accent. Uh, Can I help you? I said, Well, no, I was here during the war. I'm just looking around. Said, you were here during the war? I said, Yeah. He come running out behind the counter. I thought he was going to attack me. I thought it was one of these guys that was mad at us because when we went, went into their town, they had a beautiful little town. When we left, it was a shambles. But he picked me up off the floor. Sir, he said, we are so happy to see you. You with the 101st Airborne. And you do. I said, yeah. They said, oh, well. And then they start telling me about the celebrations and now the kids study in school and said, we know all about the war and I know all the battles. Who were you with? I said, H Company, 501. Oh, I will show you where H Company is dug in on both sides of the road and where you... Uh, and, and he and Johnny Bona, the Belgian tank commander that I met a little later, took my daughter and I, and that's how the whole thing got started. Was that Marco? Marco. And he and Johnny said, you must come back in December, he said, when the celebration is here and all the people come. And we reenact the battles. And, and that's what did it. Well, we've heard so much about all of those trips back to Bastogne. What I'm wondering is how this all has changed your life. Simply put, Before 2009, you know, my, my wife had been taken away from me. Now she's in a nursing home full time. And I'm, I was an old man sitting around waiting to die. Literally, uh, hey. And and I was I wasn't unhappy. I've lived a long life. Uh, I'm 86 years old now. No, 85 years old then. And and uh, you know. All of a sudden, with this one trip, I don't want to die right away now. <laughs> I'm willing to stay around a little bit. I'm having a ball. I still take care of my wife. But, but uh, the people I'm meeting, the events, and, the situation, and what's happening to the, my, the, the circle of friends and, and, or, or, or people that I used to be able to speak to and so on and so on. <laughs> And and uh, and also, I'm meeting a lot of guys who did the kinds of things in the war that I did, and so on. And and I, uh, what a pleasure to talk to another combat man who does this because he knows exactly what you're talking about. And and uh, you know, you can commiserate over a beer, and and uh, yet be happy as larks, just chatting that you found another guy who has shared those experiences with you. Mark, my, my life has also changed in this regard. I believe that I am now speaking to more people, uh, not, not, not veterans, I don't know if you, uh, you know, I talk in the schools, I go to the, the, the uh, church groups and so on and so on. And I, I actually one time put it in a newspaper. If any organization uh, is in need of a speaker, uh, da, 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 call. Uh, I'm doing this through, um, I'm the commander of the VFW, and uh, I'm, I'm saying we have a speaker's bureau, and, and that uh, 
if you want to, the more people that I can get the message out to, the better in that for me they're getting the real message, uh, whereas I don't know what they've read about World War II. There seems to be a renewed interest in World War II, and uh, I would like for people to have the, the right poop, okay? I can't think of a better ambassador for your generation for the paratroopers that fought in World War II. Because uh, just listening to these stories here, it's just amazing to hear them. Uh, Mark, what you're doing is really a fantastic thing because you, you've got all this stuff written down now and, and anybody can look at it, read it. And I hope everybody realizes that I have been extremely careful in everything I've said to be telling the exact truth where I wasn't sure I said that. but. What they're reading is the real story and the truth. I learned a long time ago that uh, if you don't tell the truth, it comes back to haunt you. Uh, you know the beer story? Yes. Marco found uh, uh, a man who came forth after the story was printed, who was a 14-year-old boy at the time, and says he saw me carrying a helmet full of beer into the church. <laughs> And I forgot what else, uh, uh, another uh, group I was telling the story to. When I got finished, the guy says, everything he said is right. I looked it up on the uh, internet. He had a, a, a phone uh, thing there. And he looked up uh, what I was talking about. He said, it's all there, pictures and all. Tell the truth. Or you, you live to regret it. I don't know what else to tell you, Mark. I, I uh, am having a, a wonderful rebirth. The last three years in my life have, you know, f for the better. I wonder if you can reflect a little bit, now that you've had the experience of meeting today's veterans, members of the current 101st Airborne and, and other veterans as well. Reflect on them. Are they different from your experience? No. Marco, a combat man in any war, uh, from Alexander the Great's army to ours to today's, only a handful of people are asked to face the ultimate. And the ultimate is your life. In any situation, it's just like you know some of our police, uh, some of our firefighters. Uh, some of, uh, you know, I classify them as civilian combat men. The person who has to face the ultimate and can do it and still do the job, the mission, whatever it is, and so on, has a has a a, a shift in his whole thinking, in his life, and, and everything else. Uh, you know, what's going to scare you after you've uh, been in combat? Uh, a job, a political nonsense, or uh, an earthquake, <laughs> you know. And, and there, there's, a, there's a, I don't like to use the word bonding, but, but, but there's, there's an instant comradeship. As soon as you find out the guy you're talking to has been in battle. More than the civilian combatants, the military one knows it's out there and it's immediate. And he's deliberately going into it. The civilian one, it's an iffy chance, you might. And so the guy that goes into combat and comes out has a special position in my heart. And the, the ones I've talked to now, like Marco, for example, was uh, Iraq, Kosovo, Bosnia. He'd been wounded three times. You know, I'm a, as at home with him. The, the first day I met him, 
uh, when he came out and picked me up off the ground. When he told me he was a Dutch army officer and that he had been in, in combat and so on, I did that right away. It's I, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm not explaining it properly, but uh, there, there's, there's something. That, and, and by the way, my, my heart goes out to these guys in, in, in Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, uh, who have to fight battles on the rules. You can't shoot a man unless he's pointing a rifle at you. What kind of crazy... <laughs> I know I'm voicing a political opinion here and so on, but I'm saying, listen, the military is all you've got. If you don't have the military, you don't have a country. And you better make sure that that military is uh, with you and, and uh, don't, don't, uh, don't make them feel like you send them into battle and then put one hand behind their back. The, and, and by the way, no, I better not. Uh, political opinions will go somewhere else. At any rate, Mark, I, I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to... Well, this is a rare honor here. for us, and it's so vitally important to capture these stories and to preserve them. And, and again, you've done a superb job, and I know people, I, I think not just immediately, but 50 or 100 years down the road will be looking at these and have a much better understanding of what things were really like. So I thank you very much for that and for having thank a chance you. to meet you. And... That will conclude our story, but I know that Vince's story will continue to evolve, and thank you for joining us. <laughs>